and those fish will just, I don't know, I like to say they're just leaned up against, against that ledge drinking a milkshake or something, and they see your bug come by and they eat it. But it, more times than not, I'm surprised at what's laying there. You know, all, all this turbidity all around you. You're sitting a fly on a small pillow. How do you like that? Just wallowing in your turbidity. And... <laughs> yeah. Three, two. Hello, everybody, and thanks for tuning in to Southeastern Fly. You can follow us at, at www.southeasternfly.com. We're on Facebook, we're on Instagram, or you can follow us at uh, Fly Fishing Podcast by Southeastern Fly on Facebook. Fly Fishing Podcast by Southeastern Fly on Facebook is, is relatively new. We've been doing that a couple months. We've got several people, pretty, actually a pretty good number of people in there, and that's where we got the direction to do this podcast. We did a poll. Of course, I'm big on polls to find out what everybody wants because I want I want to do these podcasts where people can use them. I want it to be u- information that can be used, and if it can be used, I want to do it for as many people as I can possibly get it get it done for. We're going to talk today about tailwaters, and that came from the Southeastern Fly Podcast on Facebook. Uh, that group. So we ran a poll. Like I said, we ran a poll, and tailwaters was the had the most hits of any of the subjects that we put out there. This is going to be the first episode of Tailwaters. It looks like it's going to be a couple episodes now about tailwaters and just talking in general about tailwaters and fly fishing for trout, particularly in tailwaters. This discussion is not scientific. It's not too philosophical, although there is some philosophy in there. It's not all theory because you can listen to some folks and you can read some things that they turn into to uh, philosophers and they philosophize and they theorize and they don't necessarily always talk about the practical which is what we want to talk about today we want to talk about practical knowledge that you can put into use Uh, this discussion is about real observations so these are observations these are things that we've observed and on our tailwaters for the past 15 or 20 years it's practical knowledge that you can put to use and what, our, what we're going to try to do is we're going to try to transfer that knowledge to you, the listener. Some of you listeners may already know some of this information. It may be old hat to you. Some of this information will be brand new to some of you. And for some, it may just be a refresher. I will say this. Keep an open mind. Remember, there's no hard and fast rule for fishing any water or catching any fish. So what works for you may not work for me, but what works for me may not work for the next guy guides you can uh, there's an old saying out there you can show a fish to 10 guides and they'll catch that fish 10 different ways i believe that because of my friends who are guides we we fish similar but not exactly the same so these podcasts aren't aren't just about me i i, I thought about just writing this stuff down and just going through it but it's not fun it's not a one-way discussion to me is not as fun as bringing in an old friend to to help us out so let's welcome a, a member of the Liars and Tires. Y'all all know about that group. Lifelong angler, watercolor artist of all things fish. He does original paintings in limited edition prints. You can find him at www.dancharlie.com. He was the guest on Season 1, Episode 3. Let's welcome back to the podcast, Dan Charlie. Dan, thanks for coming in. Great to be here. Thank you for asking me, David. And, and to clarify, you said I'm an old friend. That doesn't mean that I'm old. We just have been friends for a, a while, right? Yeah, let's clarify yeah. that. Yes, yeah. exactly. Yeah, you're not quite as old as I am. No, no, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> Some days I feel older than others. Yeah, dirt's old. And- mm-hmm. <laughs> Well, so Dan, we're going to talk about tailwaters, and you and I just, we, we spent some time earlier this week uh, talking, and we were going to really go into this in depth and see what all we wanted to talk about, and we, I think we got off on other things. We did talk about it a little bit, so we spent a few minutes, about the past 15 minutes, reviewing this, uh, the the content, if you will. This whole conversation, Dan, spurred from a article that I wrote and that you edited for me, and then Byron Begley at Little River Outfitters published it in the Little River Outfitters Journal, I think was the name of it. It's called Observations from the Tailwater. Anybody can look it up, just Google Observations from the Tailwater. You can use that as a reference for what we talk about today. We're going to try to loosely follow that article. It's looking like it's probably going to be a couple episodes. I mean, as much information that's in there, 
Uh, there's a part one and part two of the written work. So we're going to probably end up with a part one and part two here too, just because there's so much information in there that it's going to take a little bit of time to get through it all. So adventure awaits us on tailwaters, but remember safety first, right? I, I've been in some situations that were not safe on the water. Some things happen that aren't supposed to happen. Like, I guess like generation releases when they're not supposed to release trees that are down uh, across the river that you 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 know you have to spend some time trying to get around but let's talk just a minute about the generation schedule so we're pretty lucky here in Tennessee in western North Carolina we have the TVA app TVA puts out that app and they update it uh, daily about three o'clock ish central time most of the time the schedules are accurate you can also call if you want to you can call the dam and you can press one for this press two for that but you have to know which river, so it's press one for whatever the, the Tennessee River, press two for the Cumberland, and it kind of goes down. And then you put the dam number in there, and there's prompts and that sort of thing. The app is really pretty easy to use. Uh, it gives you all the selections for all the, all the Tennessee dams that are under TVA and under uh, the Army Corps. So you, if you call that, know that those, those dams, and they tell you they're subject to change. Those releases are subject to change, which does happen. If they leave the dam running a little bit longer, that's not as big a deal as if they turn it on early. So you always want to, when you're waiting, and I'm sure most of you have heard this, but I can't stress enough, you just need to be aware of your surroundings. If it feels like the water's starting to pull, or maybe your fly is starting to move a little faster, or something, if your gut's telling you, Dan, I guess I'm saying if your gut's telling you something, yeah, you better pay attention because your gut almost always is right a gut gut plays a big role in it also if you can if, if you're it's a good practice to have is say you're you're fishing uh some shallow water and there's a rock that's out of the water um if you can mark that as you're fishing and and keep an eye on that rock occasionally look over at it to see if it's if uh, water is rising up the level on, on that rock that'll help tell you if there's some flow you can also start to feel some you'll feel the flow too, but sometimes that can be subtle depending on how much water is coming out from underneath the dam. You can also see some debris in the water too. That's another sign along with the apps that you mentioned and, and calling ahead. It, it's let's face it. The, the dams don't exist, unfortunately for our fishing pleasure. They just, they're there to generate power. The, how they're operated is for that. We have to be aware of that as a fisherman who are just in, enjoying what's there for us but uh it can be a dangerous situation if you're not really paying attention you know i, I would say 99 percent of the time i can think of a couple times a year pretty much every year but a couple times a year where they turn it on and i'm not expecting it yeah i'm in a boat so it's not quite as big a deal but i've been waiting before and it is a big deal i've been on the wrong side of the river for my vehicle and gone started across the river to get river to get my vehicle get into my vehicle and turn around and find somebody else was struggling and turn around and went back and got them. By the time I got them straightened up and, and ready to go, we couldn't get out on the side of the, our vehicle where our vehicle was. So we ended up having to go out the other side of the river and get a ride. Be responsible for your own safety. But remember, stuff happens, so you need to be aware. Saving your own life makes for an adventurous story. But at the time, it ain't a lot of fun. No, no. I've had friends and family members that have gotten caught up in generation before and I uh, have one very close to me that spent some time in a tree trying to escape the, the high water, had to be rescued in order to get out of the river. Uh, and it's someone who normally pays close attention to that, too. So it can happen to anybody, but you really, it's in your best interest to pay attention. You and I, Dave, we, we pulled up at a boat ramp, not to make it too dramatic, and they were they were pulling somebody out that unfortunately had drowned. Mm. So that, that can happen. That. Yeah. Yeah, I forgot all about that. That's true. And the, and the water was off that day. It was. Yeah. But it had been off for hours, and the the guy just waited in there and waited too deep. So you fish Arkansas, you fish the Little Red a lot, so you're more probably more aware, more familiar with the Army Corps schedule and how that works. I say over here in Tennessee, Western North Carolina, pull up the app, see what the generation is going to be, but it's a little different over there, isn't it? It is. It, it, the, there's an app that I rely on a lot when I fish over the Little Red, the White, and those systems there. The the, the U.S. Uh, Army Corps of Engineer app out of Little Rock, and you can download that through your app store, and it'll have a variety of information about water releases and and, and projected schedules. The key, it, it's just a guide, and you got to remember that too. The it is subject to change. 
change. And there are plenty of examples out there where uh, Edgel said one thing only to, to find out that they were doing something else. So I'd say it's, it's correct most of the time, but it's also incorrect some of the time enough that you, again, to underline our point here, be very aware of what's going around in your surrounding. As we get on these tailwaters and we're chasing trout, trout are kind of basic creatures and those basic creatures kind of have basic needs. So trout with are basic creatures, trout have basic needs. That's kind of a easy way to say it. And if you keep those basics in mind, it'll point you uh, in a direction that'll probably help a person catch, at least have more opportunity to catch fish. I don't want to say it's going to, you're going to catch more fish. I don't think there's a hard, fast rule for anything. Like I said before, everything can be right. And sometimes they just are not eating. But if they're eating, the, the types of food that we've, we're finding on our tailwaters are, are bugs. There's a lot of bugs. And it may be that you think, oh, well, there's no bugs flying today. I don't see anything rising. But there's there's always there's sow bugs, there's scuds. There's things that are hatching that you just don't see yet that will come along later. There's smaller fish, right? Those smaller, some of the smaller fish, big fish eat little fish, bigger fish eat, eat little fish too. And you can find some of the some of the fish, some of the food for fish. So you got bugs, you've got smaller fish, crustaceans, but you can also find food in, in unorthodox locations like stocking tubes. If if the stocking truck can't get down to the river, a lot of times uh, uh, someone like TU or here in 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 Tennessee, there's Middle Tennessee fly fishers. They'll help help the agencies along, and sometimes somebody will put in a, what's called a stocking tube, and basically that's a chute that the truck parks up on the road and it looks like a big PVC pipe and they just shoot the fish down into the water, which is pretty cool. It's fun to watch. But just imagine all those fish coming down that tube and about 50 striper and, and larger trout and some small mouth and some large mouth. Just, I mean, when they heard, hear, the, hear the first four or five fish hit the water, Dan, I mean, they're here they are. They're like, hey, look, free meals. It's like sucking them through a straw. Let alone a lot of fishermen right there too, yeah. <laughs> True, true, yeah, and I can think of, of of one place here in in Middle Tennessee that there's a tube and there's a big rock, and I mean it's almost when the when the river's right, it's almost a gimme you're going to catch something yeah. there. A lot of times it'll be a bigger fish than what you think should be there, only because those fish understand that sooner or later something's going to come shooting down that tube and, and into the water. It's going to be a little bit disoriented, but I'm not going to be disoriented. Yeah. I'm going to be ready, and those fish will eat those little fish. A lot of stocking goes on at the boat ramps. They're, that's easy access for everybody. Sometimes they're they're thrown off of bridges. Smaller fish at the boat ramps, smaller fish at the accesses are a good place to go. And keep in mind that when you fish in access, you don't. It's good to walk. I mean, that's that's one of the the things that if you read any article that says anything about fishing, it's going to say be ready to walk, walk a mile, walk two miles, whatever. You'd be surprised at what's hanging around uh, a place where they stock like a boat ramp or a, an access or bridge because people go in there, they understand that, okay, they're stocking here, so I'm going to go ahead and fish here because that's where the fish are going to be. A lot of times those folks will also clean fish there. So they catch a trout or two or three or four, they want to take them home and eat them. That's fine. Would I rather somebody not take them off? Yeah, but that's part of it. People are going to people are going to keep trout to eat, and that's fine. As long as they're eating them, hey, I'm good with it. They also clean them there so there's guts and there's heads. There's all kinds of stuff laying around there. And in the evenings, you'll see some bigger fish come in there and start. If it's in the water, they'll come and get it. But they won't do it in broad daylight, and they won't be, do it when everybody's taking their boat out either. If you're looking around about dusk, early or late, you can a lot of times you can find a large fish in there. I, I suggest early you know, if you're if you're coming off the river a little bit later after everybody's kind of come off, fish those areas just a little bit. You would be surprised at what you. I'm, I'm always surprised, not always, but most of the time, I'm surprised at what's what's lurking around there, whether I catch them or not. Those fish are moving in and eating those easy meals. Fish are also, I would say, Dan, they're they're looking for protection, right? That's the that's may not be the next thing, but it's one, that's one of the basics that oh, yeah. uh, that trout are looking for. And trout, it's and it's. A little bit, of, you can look at it in terms of the evolution of fish. The trout have been around for a very long time. It's an old species, even though that trout you may be fishing for was dropped in that, that feeding tube the other, or in that stocking tube the other day. It's got a lot of evolution on its side. And one of the reasons it's been around for so long is it knows how to hide, knows how to get out of the way of danger. So there's a little, while they may fight while they're on the end of your line, they, they are more about flight and trying to seek safety. So you'll find a lot of, of, of trout that are in areas where they are, that are close to where they can seek protection. 
So it could be if they're up on a shoal, which I know we'll discuss later, if they're up on a riffle or shoal, there's a likelihood that there's deeper water nearby that they can quickly escape to. Uh, there also may be structure, some you know, large trees, large boulders that they can, they can seek cover under to get away from everything from us uh, to predatory fish to, to ospreys or eagles, anything else that may be looking for a quick meal of a trout. Uh, they are quick to realize where they are in their habitats and try to seek some, some uh, safety somewhere else. Deep water is a, is a good refuge for them. Um, it, sometimes that may mean it turns off the feet a little bit, but they're trying to seek some, some protection from uh, being exposed on that shallow water. I was talking about the food a while ago. So you got a feeding lane. And then there's also that, that riprap there. Yeah. In my mind, if a feeding lane or current runs up next to riprap, that's a great place for a fish to hold. Yeah. Uh, you've got your cover, you've got food, that feeding lane, that, that current uh, will hold that temperature down a little bit if it's running fast enough. A lot of times it'll be just a, you know, a hair bit cooler. That moving water is like a nice AC unit running for them. Maybe it's running on low, but it's running. You know, the best te temp for these, these fish, for the trout around here, for me, I would say between 50 and 60 degrees is a great temperature. You get good fights. You get you get healthy fish. You get fish that are, are in, a, in the feeding mood. Starts getting up above 60. They're still eating. I think they still eat. I think, you know, brookies will eat, eat or, or up to around 68 degrees, they say. But, gosh, that's awful, awful warm, and they're pretty delicate. And then they say rainbows up to 70 and browns up to 75. But but that 50 to 60 degree, man, that's just a, that's an excellent temperature. Uh, f for these fish and I think about like like the Hiawassee Dan have you fished the Hiawassee oh, only briefly not nearly as much as you yeah the Hiawassee there's a couple lakes up there so lakes are up they're up at elevation Hiawassee Lake's about 6,000 acres then it runs into Appalachia Lake which is about 1,100 acres then the water runs it, they run it through the dam or down the tubes running down those tubes down off the mountain I don't know if you've seen those but there's a couple tubes two or three tubes I can't remember how many uh, run down and that's what feeds the Hiawassee that the dam itself is kind of a, a similar to a spillway uh, to where if the lake fills up too much like during the winter or early spring they'll open that dam and, and bypass those tubes or run the tubes as well to let water into the Hiawassee those lakes aren't you know like they're not super deep and they're not super big they're pretty big but they're not super big like some of the ones you know, like the, the South Holston, the Watauga, super deep. So these, these lakes aren't quite as deep as that. If you've ever swam in a lake, and I'm sure that most of y'all have, you'll know that the deeper you get, the colder it gets, uh, the, the further down you go. Because you can, you can actually swim out, out in the lake a little ways and dive down, and you can, you'll feel that temperature change. That goes all the way to the bottom of the lake, too. So that's the cold water storage. Appalachia Lake just doesn't have a lot of cold water storage, and therefore the river, the river heats up a little bit. That that temperature also, once that temperature is gone, start running the run low on dissolved oxygen. Yeah. So fish are like us. They like oxygen. Yeah, they, they breathe. They get the, the air through the water. They move it through their gills. It's how they breathe. So they're, they're gonna, the, you're going to find more fish in, in oxygenated areas that have a lot of dissolved oxygen. It's been some of the problems below tailwaters, to be quite honest. You kind of illustrated why. Um, there are seasons there. We've, we've felt that in the past with some of the ones that we like to fish that are, are just bad dissolved oxygen years. And, and even though there may be plenty of fish stocked in the water, they're not very active. Um, typically, you're looking for areas that have some moving water. They've been good with uh, adding you know, weir dams and, and even uh, the sluice to add some in, an additional amount <coughs> of, of dissolved oxygen in the water. Um, but the natural sources of that are where water is flowing over structure and causing bubbles and causing more oxygen in the water. So even in those years that you may have some low dissolved oxygen in the stream, um, you can still find fish. You're just typically going to have to, to migrate to the areas where there's a, not, a lot, where there is a lot of oxygen formed from uh, the turbidity of the water. That turbidity sounded very scientific. I, I said turbidity for the for this Turbidity. Part. It's only like Let the, me open. the first time I've used it all day today. <laughs> it, I hope it is the first time. Yeah, I think so. It's, I don't know. It could have come I up earlier. I don't know. It's, it's a fun uh, word to say. Ter turbidity. 
Turbidity. Sure. You can find it around ripples and rocks and riprap and, and, and anything with structure, you're going to find some moving water that will churn and cause some dissolved oxygen in the water. Good sources. I'm pretty have. sure I can't say turbidity. I can't fit that in a <laughs> sentence. I'll have, I'll work on that though. I mean, that, that's something that. Well, let me ask you why you're thinking about turbidity, because you've got, you talked about the, the, the stretches of water that can hold trout based off of temperature. And so that can vary from tailwater to tailwater. Sometimes it, it, because of the, of the season, the amount of water they've had to pull from a lake. Uh, we've seen it at Center Hill, whatever stage the lake may be at could cause some issues in terms of how much of a reservoir, pardon the pun, of, of cold water. Um, you have areas I know in Arkansas, like Bull Shoals Dam is an enormous dam. And then as a result of all that water that's pulled through there, you have over a hundred miles of trout fishing water, as opposed to something like the Elk, which is a smaller dam here in Tennessee that may offer just anywhere from you know ten to fifteen miles of suitable trout water. Um, is that your experience too? That sometimes it may be the size of the dam, or or is it more about how how often they're pulling water through it? I think it's a combination of both. So one thing I think it is is the size of the reservoir the more acres of water you have the deeper the lake the better uh, that sort of thing that's one thing but I, it does go back to I say if they're pulling water out of the turbines for weeks months at a time that's not good if they're yeah. running it over top and spilling that's not great but it's a little better because it's taking a little bit warmer water probably off the top depending on what time of the year it is I look at that because most of the heavy heavy rainfalls in the spring whenever it's really starting to warm up a little bit so if you could pull off the top in the spring that's not as big a deal as pulling off the bottom in the spring and not as big a deal as pulling off the bottom in the summer the longer you can keep that water cool lower the more chance I think we have of cooler water in july end of july into august september and october and people forget about september and october because well the air is getting a little cooler you know you've been in around here you've been in 90 and 100 degree heat for two and a half three months and then it gets down into the low 90s and 80s and you're like oh okay this is a relief but you got to remember that water's still warm in the lakes and it's still if it was warm in august it's still going to be warm in probably in october september october maybe even in november i've seen some years where it's kind of warm in november too the water temperature i'm talking about you know and then you then you trip over into december and, and you can tell the fish start turning back on and the fish are kind of starting to turn back on a little bit and a lot of the tailwaters around here because the water's finally getting down like i said into that 50 50 to 60 degree range mm -hmm. that's helpful to us I think best case scenario is, is every lake was three times as deep as what it is, and every, everybody pulled off the top all the time. And when you turn the turn the generator on, you're running 40, 50, 60, degree, 50, up to 60 degree water, and everybody's happy. And they've got weir dams all over them, you know, four or five spots downstream. you got big boulders, big rocks like they do out west. I mean, that would be the perfect scenario. And maybe the white is kind of like that to an extent. But I don't think there's a perfect tailwater out there. But if there was, yeah. that would be what I would want. Big, deep lakes, lots of acreage, lots of oxygen, cool water all year round. I mean, if it yeah. stayed 55 all year round, that'd be, to me, I think that'd be the like the perfect trout stream. Yeah, and I think you meant to say lots of turbidity. I meant to say lots of turbidity in the, in the, in the river itself. <laughs> I hope that's actually a word. <laughs> it is now. <laughs> <laughs> or if it is i'm pronouncing it correctly <laughs> i'm sure you i'm sure you're pronouncing it better i'm going to do this dan i'm going to give a decal to the first person that could write a sentence in the southeastern the podcast by southeastern fly facebook group if you can get in there and write a sentence with turbidity in it uh i'll send you a decal Dan, Dan mispronounced turbidity. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. You win. You win. Here's you win a the sticker. Decal. There you go. Send me a sticker for my Yeti. <laughs> uh, all right. So let's move. So there, there you go. The trout are, trout are basic creatures and with basic needs. And they, just to recap that. So you got food, you got protection, you got temperature, you got, you have oxygen. And I think if you go back and listen to Joy Monleone's episode, he adds another one to that, and that's kind of a flight path out. Uh, he adds that to it as well. And I think that's that's you know an easy way to get from the food to safety is really kind of what he was talking about. So season two, episode five, uh, I talked to Joey Monleone. 
I think that's where we really started turning the corner right there and trying to get into the more fishing-related, helpful type of podcast. And I think Joey did a really good job of talking through food and protection and temperature. And that one came out in uh, in May of 2020. It was Season 2, Episode 5. It's called Why Fish Do What Fish Do. And Joey is, he's more of a, he's a, he's a TV host and that sort of thing. But he's more of a, probably more of a gear guy, actually. But he does trout fish with, with, uh, with the fly rod. And he, he, he fishes for bluegill and bass with the fly rod. But he really took it into a all-around species trying to let everybody know that hey a lot of these things that you do for trout will will actually go over and work for bass and go over and and you can transfer that knowledge every species doesn't like it the way every other species like it but there's there are a lot of things that work work with all of them but i think he did a really good job dan of, of talking through food and protection and and temperature and oxygen i think he really did a nice job with that all right, here we go. So let's move on. You want to move on? Let's move on. <laughs> Lunchtime's about the only time I wait is whenever I've got people set up and eating. Uh, I'll get out and wait a little bit, and that's only because I want to, if they've got a really cool fly rod, I'll try to try to fish it. But since you live on the stones, right, you, you've got a really good really good place there that you can wait a little bit, uh, not necessarily for trout. That's more small. That's more warm, warm water species. Give us some tips on, on waiting, and then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump in after that, and I'm going to talk about what I love, and that's floating. Yeah, waiting first and foremost, go back to the safety part. You need to make sure that you, you're familiar with the stream enough that the, you can judge how deep you're about to step into the water and, uh, and and certainly be mindful of the generation schedule. But one of the things that, that, that we found from waiting situations and, and, and tailwaters is uh, you can have a lot of people in the water at the same time. Um, we've seen that at, with a couple <laughs> of our local waters where it can get almost ridiculous. But the best thing you do is try to spread out give yourself and the the angler you're look angler you're closest to a little bit of room it doesn't mean you have to spread out so far though that you go to some secluded spot way downstream the fishing well we all think well that next bend is going to have the best fishing let me walk down past that you know well, that one doesn't look that good but the next one will the next thing you know you're you know eight miles from your your put in spot uh, and the fishing may not be as good. Some of the best spots are actually populated by the most fishermen. But at the same time, when you go into those areas that are heavy, heavily stocked areas that hold a lot of fish, some of your shoals are like that, where you'll have a lot of fishermen in those areas, it's spread out. Give yourself some room so you can go ahead and do the things that you like to do and, and also be respectful of someone else who may have gotten there even before you. The idea of, uh, of trying to make the most of the stream is, is important. And thankfully, with these tailwaters, because of the structure and, and some of the nature of, of the fishier areas, there is plenty of room for you to be able to find a spot where you can fish. The best way, though, if you're going to, if you, you know, starting to wade a river is to explore. The first trip out, you may get lucky and it's the best fishing you've ever had in your life. But for the most part, when you enter a river, especially for the first time, it's going to be about exploration and try to figure out where there are some spots. I know you've experienced this. I have as well. You can go into an area that has a lot of fishermen and find some real subtle things within the river that allow you to, 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 to find success. Amen to that. Yeah. When we talk through riffles and shoals coming up here, you could spend literally a, a whole podcast just talking about what goes on in a riffle. And there's so many, it's, it's such a complex feature of the river um, that even when it's crowded, you can find some good spots where you can, you can pick up some fish as they seek protection behind rocks and boulders and different little holes and runs that run through that, that particular riffle area. But you know more about the floating side, and I know you can, you can approach some of the, with floating, you can get away from people, first of all, but <laughs> at the same time, you're looking for areas you can pick up some fish. So. I, I try to, as I float, I try to look for areas of turbidity. Turbidity, yeah, yes. that's a key thing. Yeah, it is. It is now. <laughs> <laughs> so floating, I mean, there's, there's kayaks, there's, there are John boats, there are drift boats, there are all kinds of watercraft, there, there are float tubes and that sort of thing. There are, little, there are better ways to explore large sections of the river. So if you're floating on water, low water, you can actually scout, find out where the, where the structure is, where the different types of, of water are, and knowing that, okay, when the water comes up, you have a better idea where the fish might be holding. You'll, you'll know where the shoals are, which is important, even though they're underwater. You may not even realize they're there unless you know, unless you've been there on low water. There's a couple places on the on the tailwaters that we float 
that when the water's up, you can't tell there's there's nothing out there. I mean, it's just it just looks like a bunch of moving water. But underneath, if you know where to fish, if you've scattered it out before, you'll know, okay, I need to be fishing here because it's a shoal now, and those shoals are moving food, and they're moving oxygen, and they'll create a little bit of protection for, for a fish. They'll feel a little bit more secure there on that shoal because there's moving water all around, and it may not be secure, but they'll feel that way. Sometimes it's about what they're feeling, I think. If I had to put a thought in a fishing's head, which I try not to do, but I do all the time, Dan, shoals can be a tough place for a, for a wading angler, meaning that if you're on a shoal, and there's a, there are a lot of watercraft on the river, they're going to come through your fishing spot. Namely because most of the time there, there's no other place to go. I try to go behind everybody if I can. A lot of times I'll even say, hey, if you'll move up a little bit, I'll go behind you. Most people just say, oh, come on through. No big deal. If I come on through, I try to try to get close to the angler without knocking them over. But I try to come right up next to them. So I leave their, their fishing spot, you know, anything. You try to get within a, a broad length or two of them so that I leave all that other water for them. And sometimes it works out, sometimes it doesn't, but that, those are the things that I try to do. Because it, it can be tough. It's tough to pass somebody that's waiting a shoal because you're kind of limited on where you can go a lot of times. I guess probably need to clear up what a shoal really is. So this is David's, probably David's definition of a shoal for this particular podcast. It's hard to say, here's a shoal, and this is a shoal, and this is exactly what a shoal looks like. It's, it's a loose interpretation, but it goes, it's a shoal is a, a structure of rocks or gravel bars that goes all the way across the river from, from side to side, not, not, not the length of the river, but from side to side. A lot of times it'll cross the whole river. There'll be some spots where you can get through with a boat. A lot of times you can't get through it at all. I can think of, especially on the Watauga. I mean, it's full of, of shoals. So is the, the South Holston. So is the Hiawassee. A lot of shoals, a lot of rocks sticking up everywhere uh, that go all the way across. And you'll find these little places where you can get a boat through. That also creates like a feeding lane. If you're, if you're scouting something out, that might be something else that you want to you wanna think about as you're scouting. Is, all right, where are the, the feeding lanes here? Is that a good spot? If the river comes up a little more, is that good? But the water moves faster across the shoals. That cools the water just a little bit. Supplies additional dissolved oxygen. Again, we're back to, I mean, you, you keep coming back to those four basic things, it seems like. that. All right, where would these four basic needs be? As the water, faster water moves across that shoal, it will cool it a little bit. Not a ton, but a little. It provides that cover, that protection, feeding lane. It gives them a little more oxygen a lot of times. So you'll find some fish holding below the shoals. It, it's kind of basic, but it, 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 maybe it helps to define it a little bit more um, as to what we're talking about. We're talking about feeding lanes, and, and you often find them in the shoals. What, what we're talking about there is, is, is fish are very opportunistic. Trout are very opportunistic. They're going to go to where the food comes to them rather than try to chase down food all day long. It's just not worth their energy. So you know, seeking refuge behind a rock that over well while moving water is is flowing around that rock and bringing nutrients and food to them they'll hold behind that rock and then slip out into current to grab the food and then come back off it i mean it's not always but that's it's a it's a prime spot it doesn't matter if it's a tailwater or a free uh, flowing river a freestone river even in the river in my backyard here with the with smallmouth and bass they'll do the same thing uh, set up on a riffle or shoal, stick behind a rock, wait for food to come to them, and ambush it. How many times have you caught a smallmouth off of a shoal that's been sitting behind a rock? I bet you, you couldn't count them on both hands. There's a whole lot of similarities between that type of fishing and even some of the uh, uh, of the trout fishing approaches. Granted, you might be throwing a different type of fly at them, but um, you're little, still looking for a feeding fish that's set up in an, in an ambush spot. And you find a lot of those on shoals. You talk about too, you, you know, whether you're waiting or where you're in a boat, you can effectively, depending on the time of year, it may be really effective, is what we call shoal hop, where you're basically, mm -hmm. once you've identified the shoals, is to get to those. And if, especially if you're going to combine the, the boat and the waiting, is to get out and do some fishing there too. Hey, I don't want to give away every, every good tip, okay? Try to save some of those tips. <laughs> and, and let's not let's don't give them all away okay i like to shoal hop in the summertime when it's a million a million degrees outside and getting out in the water is refreshing <laughs> especially when it's cooler around the shoal amen um if i'm going in and out i apologize for my internet connection it's fine it, it's a large conglomerate that has my internet <laughs> but <laughs> <laughs> Within the shoals, you have a lot of food that comes through there. We talked about that too, but you, you often find, at least I have found, your hatches, 
even though the, the tailwaters can vary in terms of what type of hatches and how frequently you may have them, you do find a lot of, especially midges that are around shoal areas. That tells you the food is in, in those areas, which would also cause fish to gravitate to that. Is that your experience as well? I know you catch them everywhere, but. I wish I caught them everywhere. I mean, a lot easier well, well let me give you some credit then yeah because i have fished with david for years and and while we haven't fished together as much certainly over the last year because of covid and, and everything else and i've been basically a hermit but <laughs> when we um fish together especially if there had, had been a um you know, a few months in between trips, but you had been guiding pretty regularly during that time, we would go through stretches of water that maybe ordinarily in the past, we would have gone right over and not even fish there, that you'll now say, let's pull over here and, 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 and try this. Uh, or, or you've discovered holes, you've discovered uh, places within the shoal that actually hold fish. So going back to the complexity of, of a shoal section, um, there are spots even within it that uh, you could go over a hundred times and not realize that that's, the, that's a good spot. And then a the hundred time you find out, wow, there's fish holding right behind that, that rock there that I didn't even know was there. That's a fact. I did that. I was going to say the other day, I mean, it's, it's COVID year. So things move slowly, but or quickly. I can't decide. I guess it was back during the fall, uh, late fall that I got out to wade, believe it or not, and uh, stepped off in a hole that I didn't know was there. And I don't know how many times I've been yeah. down this river, a bunch, a whole bunch. And I just happened to get out that day and was like, hey, I almost floated my hat right there. You know, it was a much, much deeper than I thought it was. And I, I for kicked myself in the tail for not fishing it every time I go by. So now I do. Uh, and we've caught some fish out of it already. But before, pff, I'd have blown right through there. And it goes back to lesson number one, safety first, right? Yeah. <laughs> Seriously, yeah, there it is, does. My, my wife will 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 she'll ask me about this. Actually, maybe direct me to do this, but especially fishing water at night, and and that's a whole other podcast. But night fishing, uh, it, it it may be in your best interest to have some personal flotation device with you when you're wading, and especially when you're wading water that you're not familiar with. So let me put a plug in there. Going back to safety first. Tell you what, everything doesn't look like home waters. Everything doesn't look that way. So home waters, let me back up here, Dan. So home waters is a painting that you did. It's got some, what does it got? It's got like four rainbows uh, and a brown, I think. It's it's hanging downstairs. Anyway, it's I, I got the print. That bottom is these are, are these big round river rocks that are all, I mean, you've painted them in there like they were laid in there by a, a brick layer. It's beautiful, and the trout are suspended over it. you got a big brown and two or three big rainbows. I can't remember. But every river bottom doesn't look like that. No. So I think the safety thing, I think it does come back to you do need to be safe. You do need to watch where the heck you step. It does come back to that. But also be aware that where you're stepping, be aware that that could be in, in, in water that's ankle deep. If you step off in a hole that's knee deep, there's a definite opportunity that the next time that you come by there, you might want to fish it because there might be a fish there. That's a great point and something I've learned as well. Stepping off into a, a spot one time, you ruin the hole when you stepped into it, but the next time you come back, I bet you fish it. Heck yeah, you do. If, you, if, if you're paying attention, you do. Yeah. So very often, a shoal is going to fall off into a deeper pool. Right there at that transition, there's quite a bit of oxygen usually. There's a little bit of protection, so if, if they're sitting in that pool up against that shoal looking upstream, there's oxygen coming through there. There's some protection there because they're in a little bit, maybe a little bit deeper hole. It doesn't have to be feet deeper. It can be a foot deeper, uh, and, and that could be that pool. But there's often food coming through there. If they're, if they're bugs hatching upstream on that shoal, a lot of time the spent bugs will come down and they'll be eating those. Be a little bit of cooler water there. So as you'll come off that shoal, the leading edge of that pool is a really good spot to start your transition into maybe a little bit, maybe an adjustment on an indicator. Uh, maybe a little bit different current. The current probably slow down a little bit uh, as, it, as it falls off into that pool. You'll go from a pretty quick coming across a, a, a rocky shoal or a, or a you know a gravel shoal riffle. That fly, that current will slow down a little bit. If you're fishing a dry, you'll want to slow that down as well. That transition, any transition area is really pretty good in my mind. I think next you kind of come to the, you come to ledges. Um, a ledge is not always a, a large drop either. Like we think of ledges. I think of ledges. I think of the Holston. There are a lot of ledges there, like pretty good size or a couple, of few pretty good size ones that I've been over. They don't always have to drop two, three, four feet. That's not always the big ledge. Sometimes it's just a, 
six inch ledge or an eight inch ledge you know multiple of those kind of kind of stepping down arguably i think those provide the best cover dam anywhere yeah. because you've got that water that water moving across those ledges is speeding up slowing down turning under that sort of thing i, I agree that, that and i've had great experiences with fishing ledges especially even on the on um, on the little red uh, i can think of some trips um chances on the river with my fishing with my dad um fishing on some ledges that actually went into a bend in the river uh and we still talk about it one of the best experiences we had in terms of picking up fish and we were nymphing through there but that ledges can be a great spot to nymph too i know you you're you're a nymphal maniac so <laughs> you love uh to drop oh, uh off the buck <laughs> off, of, off of a ledge but because you got that transition as you talked about you know fish a, Again, holding in a spot that may be less current, um, but when faster current is nearby, and you find that with ledges a lot of times. So they can seek protection of the ledge. They can also seek protection to get away from predators right by the ledge as well. So it's a great holding spot for fish. It's a perfect ambush spot. Food's coming to them. They're quick to jump out from that ledge and and grab food. So um, why wouldn't you fish a spot like that? Not to mention the dissolved oxygen that's, that's, that's working through there, the oxygen for the fish. Yeah. Was that a beer that I just heard? No, that was a, that oh. was a charcoal pencil that I knocked oh, off my desk. Okay. Well, if you need to get it, go ahead. We're, we're doing this in my workspace here. So. <laughs> <laughs> but, I was hopeful that wouldn't come up on, on, on my microphone, but it didn't. It's, it's a all pencil. Good. It's all good. It amazes me. The size of a fish that'll sit at the bottom of a ledge, uh, even a, a five or six or eight inch ledge, the size of a fish that'll be leaned up there that you'll catch like right at the foot of a ledge, like boom. And it, it doesn't always yeah. have to be running across the river. Sometimes it's it's running, you know, with the, with the current, that ledge is coming off the yeah. side or something. And those fish are just, I don't know, I like to say they're just leaned up against, against that ledge drinking a milkshake or something and they see your bug come by and they eat it. But it, more times than not, I'm surprised at what's laying there. You may not always catch yeah. it, but but it's definitely some some bigger fish laying there. You definitely find it in the tailwaters, and, it, it, and I'll draw a comparison to a more of a it was a spring creek, so it's not a tailwater, but the structure is is basically the same. But I remember fishing one here in Middle Tennessee, crystal clear. You could see right down to the bottom, everything there, and the water was probably two to three feet deep. But there was some ledges that kind of ran lengthwise on the river, uh, coming off of one bank, and. Um, fishing with my, with a, a brother-in-law and, and I fished it. I, there was no fish to be seen whatsoever. You could clearly see the bottom. There's just nothing there. And this was something that was more of a seasonal stocking area. And he proved me completely wrong by catching fish after fish, by just drifting th- something right by that ledge. And they were all tucked up underneath there. And uh, just a, an eye opening experience for me about fishing ledges. Thank you, Bubba. <laughs> <laughs> Bubba teaches you a lot. Bubba did teach me a lot. I guess there are ledges on every every float that I do, but a lot of times you'll you'll they'll be leaned up against an undercut bank, yeah. or right up against a. It may not be undercut; it may just be a a, a steep drop off that that looks. I, I could compare that to a ledge if I was being a little loose with the definition. But a lot of times, if there's grass up there on the on the on the bank, you can throw a hopper in the summer there, and that's a great place to oh, yeah. to get get a, a good hit with a good fish because like you said you, it just there are fish laying there yeah whether you think there are or not it's worth running a, a fly through there yeah whatever you're fishing run it through so multiple ledges so let's talk about that just a minute multiple ledges produce more turbulent water so if you have like two or three ledges in a row and you're fishing like a a, a dry fly or something like that, it's always good to get a little bit higher riding dry fly. It makes it a little easier to see, which is always big. But it's also it help it's helpful because it helps you sustain that drift a little longer as you're bouncing that fly across those ledges. And I'm talking about ledges now that are going uh, back and forth across the river from side to side. So it's a drop off after a drop off after a drop off, and it may not be a big one. It may be three or four or five inches drops off then another couple of inches off the next ledge and then another couple of inches off the next ledge so those are some good places for some drives and i'm thinking now i'm thinking about the hiawassee specifically there are a lot of those types of things in the hiawassee not huge ledges but just small drop offs, small ledges that drop off to the next ledge and you may have one or two and then there may be a pool that's six feet and then you may have another one or two little ledges and it's just dropping off a couple inches at a time 
there's a sp- specific place in the trophy section at the Hiawassee that I love to go fish on the it's kind of on the back side about halfway down and I could pick it out it all looks the same to everybody else I swear it does but to me I go to that spot because I've had success there before with a dry fly I continue to go back there whenever I get to go over there which is pretty fun and sometimes I catch fish there and sometimes I don't but I guess maybe that's just part of my I guess it's a ritual mm-hmm. you know I just kind of end up end up trying to seek that out if I'm going that direction I'll try oh, yeah. to make sure that I make it through there we are we're all that way you have a good day somewhere you're always going to go back even if that day never repeats itself you always remember it and and it's too hard to pass it up i'll tell you this i taught a friend of ours to fish on the watauga uh and he got real good we went to to a hole that that dropped off of a off off of a ledge through a little bit of a ripple and then, then into a pool we went there and i said all right there's there's three different types of water here we went through that and then he caught i don't know he caught one fish and then he didn't catch anything for a while. And I took f- the fly rod. I said, here, just do this. Caught another fish. And then whenever he got in that groove, he just, he, I swear he caught every fish in that 10 yard section, mm-hmm. fishing three different types of water. The next time we went there, I told another friend of ours that went with us, I said, I'll bet you $10 that Jim goes straight to that hole. And what he do as soon as we got everything, ca- got camp set up, he went straight to that hole and probably caught another 10 fish out of it. It was really, it was really cool to watch him do it. Yeah. I mean, and I never, I never said anything to him. I just said, I know you're going to go there. And he did. So it's that experience. It got his confidence up, especially for that trip after having, having a tough time the first trip. When he went back the second trip, he caught fish right off the bat. And I think that really helps, yeah. you know, as soon as you get there or, or real close to it. And you can do that if you're on familiar water. It's a little tougher if you're, if you're on uh, unfamiliar water. But if you learn how to fish a ledge on the Hiawassee, you can probably catch a fish off of the little red using some of the same techniques oh, and, yeah. and some of the same identifiers. When you think about it, even when I was, I was talking, telling about the, the time fishing with my dad, the way I described that, the series of ledges, um, you can imagine that if the ledges get more defined, you have what you call stair steps, which are, there's a fine line, I guess, between Saturday night and Sunday morning. Yes. Yeah, exactly right. <laughs> what I was about to say too. <laughs> When you're referring to stair steps, you're talking a more dramatic drop, are you not, in terms of... Yeah, yeah, uh, I am. Yeah. I think that's a good definition. I think the listener out there, just remember, that's the definition that we're using here. Yeah, true, true. But it makes sense, and I know what you're talking about in a, in a series, it, and often it is within the, the the complex structure of a shoal, you will start to find those stair steps near the end of the shoal, I would imagine. But those, at the same time, much like ledges provide some great opportunities for fishing the I guess starting at the downstream angle and fishing up towards the the last stair step in the in the series but the first one that you'll come up to if you're fishing downstream or fishing upstream from a downstream angle so you're saying fish the lowest stair step first trying to say that yes yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yep. okay you yep. said it better I than I did I'm with you. <laughs> it was making a lot more sense in my head yeah but no, another, it's just a more, a more dramatic drop than in the ledges, but still the same concept as we've talked about through, through uh, the shoals and, and, and ledges, it's areas where a fish can, can uh, a trout can, can hold and cover, be able to get out and feed, to get to seek safety, going back to the fight or flight definition we were talking about early on, though the stair steps are just set up for that. So for an angler, you know, you probably have a likelihood of having feeding fish in those zones. So whether it's dry fly or dropping off of a, a nymph through that section, uh, streamers will work too, depending on what, what angle you're fishing. They, there's a likelihood you're going to have feeding fish in those areas because it's, it's highly oxygenated water. Plus, it's bringing food to them. And you're talking about fishing streamers. You can fish a floating line with a, a light uh, streamer. It doesn't necessarily have to have no weight, but just very little weight and get caught in that turbulence and look like a dead shad or a dead smaller fish coming over. Mm-hmm. Dude, that'll work. You know, a lot of times people will work nymphs over those ledges. Same thing, throw it in right into the wash, if you will, mm-hmm. of, those, of, of those ledges and just let that nymph get down there and seek out a fish. But I don't think you can... It's hard to pass up fishing those ledges with a dry fly. Yeah. It looks like a eh, dry fly is probably not going to work in there. But if you can find those little soft pillows, 
that are on the edges uh, of that water that's flowing over those bigger ledges. There's a lot of soft water in there. If you can get a dry fly to sit in there for any length of time, number one, it's a challenge like you've never seen to be able to get it to sit in there without getting any drag on it. So you have to be able, almost have to be able to reach the pillow, if you will. It's 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 a by by soft water, I mean very little if any current so you may have current going around all sides of this one little spot and if you can get a dry fly to sit in that one little spot and just keep it in there for as long as you could possibly stand it a lot of times a fish will look up and say that's an easy meal one i'm not having to work too hard because it's soft water two maybe it's been sitting there for a while three i'm hungry finding those little pillows or that soft water man that's just a lot of fun you can pull multiple fish a lot of times out of one of those little little pockets of soft water that may not be any bigger than a five gallon bucket something to keep in mind there are challenges with the nymphing part of it especially with that soft water which often is a, is a an eddy and the flow may be actually going back upstream so it can be very yep. challenging to get a good drift through those sections unless that fish is right there on the seam uh, of the moving water and, and the, the eddy you you really have a chance of, of having an abnormal drift that won't work fishing that level of turbidity one of the <laughs> turbidity is a thing. One of the things that she, I think that goes back to what I don't remember which one, which episode it was, but we were talking about no leader, no tippet, obviously no fly line laying on the water that with a dry, you're just sitting there with that fly, just the hackle in the tail. And of course, a little bit of the hook. If you can just set that in there and just let that dry, just sit there in that, in that state and just kind of work around that, work around that, that pillow. That, when you catch a fish like that, you let me know if it's not one of the greatest things ever. Cause it just, it's a, it's a wonderful feeling. Mm-hmm. You know, all, all this turbidity all around you and you're sitting a fly <laughs> on a small pillow. Just wallowing <laughs> in your turbidity. And... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There's nothing better. <laughs> nothing better than that. <laughs> no. So some of the stair steps that I, I fished, I've run a boat right through them and then stopped and, and rode back and dropped the anchor and fished them and still caught fish, you know, within two or three minutes. I mean, they're, I'm glad they're not as smart as we like to think they are. That may be, that may be the best way to put that. Cause if they were as smart as we thought they were, they'd never eat during the day. Yeah. I've backed the boat up and dropped the anchor and fished that. Two minutes later, caught a fish out of the same spot we just ran a 16-foot boat through. You know, and the yeah. fish is right back eating. So there's all kinds of different water within those stair steps. You've got the pillow. You've got the rushing water. You have the seams. And you you touched on the seams just now. Uh, you were talking about the fast water moving by the that pillow. But there are seams of fast water up against a little bit slower water that work their way into that to that water that's moving, you know, in reverse or back up the river right off of one of those ledges. If an angler takes the time to really dissect those ledges, you can spend a better part of a half a day there working one set uh, if you can get in there and, and if there's enough room to wade and that sort of thing. Or you can just keep moving the boat down the ledges or, or park at the bottom and, and fish that lower and fish your way up. You know, there's a lot of different ways to do that. And you bring up a, a really good point, too. It's the, the concepts we're trying to, to talk about here. You're looking for fish that are actively feeding and, and, and in fishing areas that could be likely for ambush areas or, or feeding zones, then maybe one in the same. My experience, if the fish is unwilling to eat, I'm going to have a hard time catching it. So you're looking for, for areas where you know that there's, there's, there's a greater chance that there should be fish in here using this area as a place to feed and i think the stair steps along along with the shoals and and the structure that we've talked about are just that's what we're we're talking about is try to focus your time on those areas where there's a greater likelihood of an active fish flying is that correct the places where i'm confident that i'm going to catch something there's protection something laying around there that the fish can get to for protection there's oxygen coming across something. Maybe it's a gravel bar. Maybe it's a shoal with some rocks. Maybe it's um, running up against some riprap, a ledge, something like that. There's food coming across there, obviously. And then oxygen, of course. It has the four basic things that we were ta- that we talked about early on in this episode. Those four things. Every time that I say th- with confidence, right? So sometimes you're floating down the river and you're like, you know, that looks like a good spot. I hadn't caught over the- anything over in a while, but... You may float a fly through there 10 different times and not get anything, but the the places that I'm like, you have to be ready here. Those four basic things that we talked about are are available there. These structures typically tend to gather fish, and that's where you would be best spending your time if you're looking at dissecting a tailwater. 
you you can talk this stuff through and learn more. You can philosophize yourself into a corner that doesn't work too, but keep it in your mind that this is just practical use, real observations that we've seen. It's super lucky to be out there. I mean, yeah. not a lot of people get to, to take people fishing and not a lot of people get to fish as much as what they want to. Not a lot of people live on a river and walk out there mm-hmm. back door like you do and, and get the opportunity to fish all summer. Uh, as soon as you get done doing something, you might cut the yard and then go out and fish a hopper right where you just sprayed some hoppers into the water i mean you've got the perfect place for that so we talked about safety be safe trouts are basic creature creatures with basic needs then you talked about waiting i talked about floating we talked about shoals ledges stair steps or steps i think it's good conversation i think i had a realization there that that i'm hopefully picking out the right places to put a put a fly but remember if there's anything that we want the watchers listeners to learn and, and remember it's the word of the day. Turbidity. Still not completely confident it's a word, but I'm gonna look it up here in a minute and see. I bet it is a word. If it's not, it is now. So all right. So you can find Dan at DanCharlie.com. You can find us at, at uh, southeasternfly.com on Facebook, Instagram, or like I said, at the Fly Fishing Podcast by Southeastern Fly on Facebook. And if you're the first one there to to write a full sentence using the word turbidity, uh, I'll send you a decal. Uh, that you can put on whatever you want to, a Southeastern Fly sticker. Thanks for supporting Southeastern Fly and all the things that we do and the things that we try to do. We hope it works for you. See you next time on Southeastern Fly. am i trying to say take six oh, no, this isn't my part <laughs> <laughs>